recognizing that there was some input in the lower house by a shadow spokesperson on finance, MP Mark Golden. And those suggestions apparently found its way into the current regulations. That's good. But it would be better, in my view, if the consultation moved beyond parties and beyond members of the House to the trustee, the worker trustees in these schemes, to the broad group of pensioners, because this regulation is a fundamental departure from what was there before. We are not going to be negative about it, but it is going to affect significant members of the society who are the productive sector because it is the workers and the people in pension who often contribute most to the productive and the production of our country. So I'd have preferred, Senator Charles, if the discussion was wider, given the implications of these regulations. And I also wish to ask you very early whether or not there's a definition of speculative schemes, because that's important. Because we're saying people shouldn't get into speculative schemes, but they don't know what is a speculative scheme if there is no definition of it. It's going to be left up to everybody to decide. Mr. President, I hear the promise of 30 to 50 billion dollars being released and available for investment under these regulations. But I've come to learn that while we can't amend these regulations here, I've come to learn also that I shouldn't jump to promises too quickly. The number of people or the percentage of the population in pension scheme is less than 10 percent. Less than 10 percent. So yes, it appears to affect a small amount of people, but a very important because we're looking at a pension asset pool of about $600 billion. So it's important that we treat this resolution with all seriousness. And this is why I want to thank you personally, Minister Charles, for facilitating the debate on the regulation. Had we gone last week to do it when the opposition wouldn't be prepared, wasn't prepared, it certainly would not be beneficial to the society. I would lose at least the benefit of public education on the pension scheme and the importance of pension and retirement scheme to the country. I thank you. I am happy that we didn't go for the one hour discussion on Wednesday. Because how could we discuss such an important issue in a rush hour on Wednesday? So I want to thank you very much for facilitating our Mr. President, too few Jamaicans are in pension schemes. Too few. The tourism pension thing worked on by the previous administration and this administration with almost will be the largest pension scheme in the country, surpassing even the NIS, which is supposed to be mandatory. But notwithstanding that, too few people are in pension scheme. And the country is going to suffer in the end because more people are not in pension and retirement schemes. This is why, Mr. President, and the other paper of this Senate, resolution number three, notice of which was given on the 2nd of December 2016 by me, needs to be debated. Yeah. It needs to be debated. There can be no good reason 
one important resolution like this, except for the fact that I move it, is it not being discussed. This is too important to the country's economy. And I'm begging the government to put before the end of the year, don't make it three years of sitting on the table. Yeah. Just move on the 2nd of December 2016. I'm begging the government to debate the resolution which calls for us to encourage savings and pension schemes and retirement schemes. It called for a select committee to be established to propose ways and means to encourage greater participation of the population in pension schemes and retirement. What, Mr. President, could prevent this from being debated here? I won't ascribe any motive, but I'd urge the government side in your caucuses to implore and, and the lead of government business to bring this resolution quickly to the Senate for debate. It makes sense. It makes sense, and I ask for that. Mr. President, out of such a debate, we may spur other people to become involved in pension. The security guards, 25,000 of them out there. Why are they not in a pension scheme? Why can't we do something for them? Just as Porsche seems similar as Minister of Labor, ensure a, an insurance scheme to protect them. It's time for us to look at them, look at the minimum wage workers, and see if we can create up some pool of funds to get a pension scheme yes. for them. If we don't do this, the state is going to have to pick up the tab yes. at the end of the day. Wow. Let us be proactive. Let us find ways to do it. As Peter Phillips led the improvement in the economy, let's find some resources out of that rather than people being greedy to use it for the needy. That's what we need. And so I'm proposing that at the next review of the minimum wage, which affects security guard minimum wage, that the Ministry of Labor creatively seek to introduce a pension scheme for the lowest level of workers in the country. Let's think about it. Newland and others in the 60s were able to come up with the NIS. 50 years of NIS, time to review it. Time to see the weaknesses and how we can rebrand and reposition it from the current deficit situation to a creative thing which take care of the vulnerable in our society. Michael Manley did it with the creative thinking out of the box for the National Housing Trust. And Senator Williams, some of the guards now are paying 3% for housing trust more than ordinary worker because employers have sought to use the contract label and to say they are not workers. So they are paying more to the, N to the NHC than they should be paying. That is those who are paying. We can find a way to pull some of those funds that they are overpaying into a pension arrangement to protect them. So we're talking about how we can improve a pension situation for the vulnerable in this society. And I make that proposal for the Ministry of Labor to look at. Because if they don't, when my side come back, I'll be insisting that they do so. Another issue I want to raise, Minister. It won't be long. They know, and they know too. They know too. Mr. President, it's important that this discussion and the issue I raise about the vulnerable, that it takes place against a certain background. The background, since you asked me which side, of one side promising from poverty to prosperity, Senator Hill, 
But the reality of the first two years of this government is that poverty has increased. Let me say it again. The reality, the reality is that of this government, the first two years, poverty has increased. <laughs> did I hear somebody say, KD, did I hear somebody say, no data? Because I'm waiting for my friend to get up on a point of order. No, See, not. Mr. President? No, I'm not order. Tabled in this Senate no. this morning. Tabled in this Senate this morning is Ministry Paper 51 of 2019. Cabinet Agenda Issues 10th June 2019 under the signature of the Most Honorable Prime Minister. This is what it said in part. Analysts of the 2017 poverty rate. Cabinet considered a report from the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service on poverty rates for 2017 calculated from the Jamaica Survey of Living Condition, JSLC data. So coming from the data, Senator Hill. We read and decide, you know. Yeah, yeah. The reporting, this is what cabinet is saying to the house. The report informed that in 2017, the economy grew by 1% and registered an increase in the number of people employed by 26,200 by July 2017. You accept that part, don't you? And then it continued. But, but, despite the positive outturn, the overall poverty rate increased by 2.2 percentage points to 19.3 compared to 17.1 percent recorded in 2016. Due to increases in the Kingston metropolitan area, KMA, and other towns. Mr. President, the report from the Prime Minister and matters from Cabinet continue. The report further informed that the regional profit, profit, poverty rates were 17.1% for the KMA and 20.1% in other towns and rural areas, respectively. The overall increase in poverty reflected regional increases of 5.2 percentage points in the KMA and 4.1 percentage points in other towns. And conversely, the poverty rate recorded for rural years was similar to the rate recorded in the previous year, that is 20.1% in 2017 compared to 20.5% in 2016. And this is what the Prime Minister continued to say in his report to those. The report also informed that the KMA, after recording declines for four consecutive years, pause, Four consecutive years from 2017, we'll take it to 2013. We were there then. So it was reducing then, but it continues. As a change guy. The report also informed that KMA, after recording declines for four consecutive years, registered the largest increase in poverty, reflecting a decline in mean per capita consumption in real, per, in real terms by 30%. And an increase in poverty no was recorded for city. other towns for the second mayor. consecutive year. No prosperity in the city, mayor. Which worsened the standard of living in that region. It is advised that despite a contraction in the city agricultural poor, sector due to severe flooding in 2017, rural area yeah. poverty remained stable at 20.1%. And noted yeah. that the measures introduced by yeah. the government assisted in curtailing the increase in poverty rate. People are poor. Who signed that again? Then it says, Mr. President, the Honorable House is asked to note the foregoing. Andrew Holness, MP, Prime Minister. Who signed again? July 2019. Who? Prime Who Minister Andrew Holness. Okay, sure. So the data is here. So you Problem is that you don't look for it. So you confirm no prosperity. In so, and other towns. City getting poorer on the labor. And other towns. So the government, we're debating this pension issue and the background of poverty increasing instead of pros prosperity for the people. So I put that out there because, Mr. President, if you promise prosperity, you ought not to be giving the people yeah, poverty. Yeah, yeah, man.
Just like you want me to sleep with the window and doors open. And the corruption thing. All right. Promises broken. So, President, now that you that I hope would have been addressed by the regulations, Senator Charles, is the issue of retirement age. Uh, retirement age. Okay. Connected to pension, right? Retirement age. <laughs> right. Senator Brown, Senator Gill. If you're poor, the money can't spend. People ask you regular as they do, ask me, what is the retirement age? When I can retire? People ask that question. I don't think we have a national retirement age. We know judges at by law at 70 or whatever. We know some people in the public sector at 60. We know some at 65. And of course, politicians don't retire. They have to get wheelchair for them. <laughs> or wheelbarrow. But the issue is, isn't it time for us to settle on a national retirement age? So it doesn't move from trust deed to trust deed, pension contract to pension contract. Recently, Mr. President, the parliament in Bermuda, the assembly, unanimously approved a retirement age of 68 for everybody. I'm not saying it should be 68, but I'm saying it's something we must consider. Too often people come to me. I'm asked to retire at age 60. But I can't get my NIS pension until age 65. Yeah. What do I do between 60 and 65? Sorry, Senator. It's something we need to resolve. Yeah. And we come here in support of the regulation. But we must address some of the issues flowing from it. So don't fret, Minister, we support it. Right? The FSC and others need to work with us. And we in the Parliament need to resolve what is a national retirement age. Yeah, we need to do that. Others are doing it. We need to do good it. Mr. So President, there's an article in the papers today about Sorry, the... Brown, Sir? as a matter of interest, what, what age you would... I don't come here... No, as a matter I come here with an open mind. Because I look at a society that is aging, I look at a lot of young people coming and say, if you hold the position and then, what about me? It's a national discussion on it, which is part of why my motion move tabled in 2016 December should be debated. And I'm seeking your support, yeah, Mr. Mr. President, in getting the House leader to put that on the agenda. Let us debate this thing. Let us see how we can improve the country. Because when I sent, there's an article about pension in today's cleaner, which I sent out this morning to a number of persons. And they all responded. All of them recognize that there's a risk involved with this. But making a fundamental change. There are risks. And yes, risks are necessary to be taken. But risks also have downsides that we must look at. We have seen in this country the financial sector meltdown. We've seen in the United States, in Asia, in other countries, not unique to us. What if there's a meltdown from in this country? What will happen to the pension schemes and the pensioners? Have they been given sufficient thought to how we're going to protect the pensioners? I am proud to say FINSA was the tool used to save people insurance and their pension saving in the night. That's what FINSA was about, a vehicle to save workers. I remember, I remember being with Minister Davis at Jamalco during the meltdown when the workers impressed upon him. What is going to happen to my savings? Senator Brown was in Trinidad one time when his key could crash and people driving them car and them license gone. Them registration and insurance gone. Just so. We have to ask what protection is there in this for those pensioners whose money will be invested 
into some of these schemes. Granted, not the whole 600 million, maybe 30, million maybe billion. billion, 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 maybe 30, maybe 50. But we need to ask what protection is there for them. See, Saint Gill, most of the schemes have now gone to what they call CD, right? So that you are DC, 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 defined contribution. Defined contribution. That is to say, whereas, like the government, you get a certain amount when you retire, they say you will only get what your money can buy. Which is what your money can buy. Whereas, so, if these schemes were a defined benefit scheme, if these schemes were a defined benefit scheme, it would mean that the employers who sponsor these schemes would have to put the money in and take the risk. And they would probably oppose what is happening now as they did in the past. So, now that most of the schemes are defined contribution, DC schemes, the risk passed center gill to the members of the BITU, the UAW, the NW, UK Civil Service Association, to the people who we represent as workers. So, the issue is, what protection are there in the regulation? I heard the minister speech in parliament during the budget, but I still don't feel the consultation with the unions right. and with others as we rush to open the sesame without me seeing the protection. Let me give you an example, Minister. Clause 36A, the last one on the page, on the thing. It says essentially that upon a person ceasing to be an investment, investment manager of a fund or scheme, that person shall provide the trustees of that fund or scheme with the investment records kept on behalf of the trustees in relation to the fund. What if they don't do it? What if the investment manager don't do it? What happens? What happens if they vex that we have salary issues? What if they vex and it, it doesn't pass it over? You go to a quarter, a long drawn out thing. I mean, take Marilyn Hamilton versus UGI. She got fired in 2006, and her case is still going through the system today. Her take, what I saw in the Contractor General first report, in the Integrity Commission first report, they're waiting a, rev a decision on a judicial review point. Since 2013, six years ago, how can that be? How can that be? You are waiting judgment six years because it's not my union, it's big people business. So the silence may be beneficial to those who challenge. I don't know. But it can't, doesn't look right for it to take six years. So in respect to 36A, that is a new clause to go into the regulation. What penalty flows from it? A failure to do it. So I'm talking about protection for those who have to take risk. Protection for the workers. So we agree with the regulations generally, but it can be better. It can be. President, another area that this hasn't touched really, having to do with surplus. Can't go both ways. Surplus may diminish or the surplus may increase from the risk taken. What has been happening in the country, President, is a lot of people coming out of pension schemes. Wholesale redundancy. There's a company, for example, that had about 4,000 employees, now down to 500 or thereabout, or even less. That's a lot of pension money built up over the years. Take another one we saw the court pronounce on recently, Alcon where the sponsors want a bag of the money and the court is saying, no, let the workers get the bag. But I'd love to hear those who are regulating our pension address that issue of surplus. Yes. 
especially against especially against the background of that case, Air Jamaica case, yes. which went all the way to the Privy Council. That's a long time. Jai has died. Jai Charlton, you know her cover. She led that fight all the way to the Privy Council to protect the pensioners. It's time that those who are dealing with this address the issue of surplus. All yes. surplus yes. must be decided. Yes. Yes. Because the workers get shafted too often. Right? There are many. There are, I mean, I could go. People come to me. St. Thomas, Spanish Town Road. What do we do? Given the good work that the leaders of the trade union movements have carried out to put in pension scheme, no employers are backing out from them. Yeah. And looking to gobble up the surplus. We must protect the workers. Yeah. And Senator Gill, in this, you and I have a duty. We must encourage the workers, especially those who have been made redundant, to leave some of the money in the pension scheme. I don't need applause for that. I need applause for that. I need the workers of this country to know that taking all the money, just leave the surplus to the employer. All the contribution of the employer just stay there and then they find a way to take it out. Whereas, and sadly enough, I've seen workers who redone that many years ago come to me and say, what about pension now? Because I'm read 60 odd now. And I say, did you leave your money there? No. No. So you and I, Senator Gale, and the rest of us in the movement, we have to educate workers that it is important that you leave a little piece in the pension fund. So when time comes, you can get something. But the truth be told, I had a discussion sent us free with my wife one day this week. She said to me, a good friend of ours now finds herself in a position where she had to be buying quarter of the medication yeah. president prescribed by the doctor. So instead of taking two pills, they're taking half a pill. Yeah, we are killing them. Yeah. Yeah. We are killing them. So what to find a way to tell the, the younger generation that a future is coming when they are going to be a little older than they are today. You have to tell them that they are going to be a little older. And it is important, therefore, that they prepare for the future. And all of us in the Senate, all of us in this House, in the Parliament, need to go on a crusade to do that. It benefits the country by the saving. I grew up in the era, President, of penny banks. I don't know if you know that, because you'll have put in more than penny. No, 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 no. More than put in penny. <laughs> but, but penny banks encourage the ad, habit of saving. Yeah. We have to make our people financially literate. We have to tell them that a house was sale so many years ago at $15,000. Will become one week's paycheck later on in life. Yeah. Invest in it. Invest in it. In due course, you will find the mortgage easy. And even so today at some of the rates. But we have to get our people, especially the middle class and the poor, to see investment opportunities in the country. Pension is but one of them. Pension is but one such thing. And which is why, again, I plea. I plead, not for partisanship, to the government side. Let's discuss the pension thing in the interest of Jamaica, to the benefit of Jamaica. Let's put the resolution on the floor and let us discuss it. So, Mr. President, I want to urge as we look at private pensioners, because in the government center, Sinclair, Senator Charles, 
is going eventually to set up a fund in which they are going to contribute for public sector pension. And that is also a defined contribution scheme. And what we are going to have to ask, because how do we protect the vulnerable? JADEP came about to help ease the medical costs. One of the biggest costs for pensioners now is medical bills. Medical bills. Added to that, the water rate and the light bill keep going up. I don't know how the pensioners survive. But for the mercies of the father and for some children. But not every one of them have children. So I'm going to urge the government, another suggestion I want to make to the government, so it's not said that the opposition don't make suggestions. I ask the Ministry of Health and Labor, Ministry of Health and Labor, to look at the impact of the current economic policies on pensioners. So we know we're starting with people over 60. So we're not asking for everybody. Ask for such a study to be done to see whether or not, as part of so called free health, we can free up the cost of medication to the elderly. I don't know what the cost is going to be, but let's just discuss it and see, for example, if that worker will work 30, 20, or 20 or 30 years in government, or in general, if we can't find a model which says, whether through the health, National Health Fund, which has already subsidized, don't get me wrong, that what we can do better. Because it can't be, the measure of a country, not a party, our country, is how we treat the vulnerable and the young people. And I believe we can do something. We ought to do something for those who can't get the full medication only because of the deficiency of their pension. So I'm not asking you to up the pension, though that would be good. That would be good. But we can do other things. We can do it by subsidy of the health needs. And we, National Health Fund, I know, have a list of everybody, Mr. President, who reach 65. When I reach, is it 60? Them send me quick, quick, quick a card. But some of you don't reach out to so you can't get a card. <laughs> <laughs> but they are efficient. Oh, I know, oh, I know 60. Oh, no. 60. Yeah. <laughs> so this is why I want us to agree on a national retirement age. I'm wrong. No. Mr. President, the speaker's time having passed 60 I'm minutes. Rapid. I'm rapid. Sorry, 30 minutes. I'm rapid. So you want to give 60 minutes. It's so good. I'm rapid. I'm we, we ask that he has sufficient time to complete his presentation. You have heard the question. Those in favor? Aye. Senator. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm wrapping up. I'm wrapping up. So that proposal is something practical. We can't amend the regulations, but we can work on it. And I don't claim paternity for it. I'll be happy if you do it. Because again, if you don't do it, we are going to do it. You may think so. You may think so. You all may think so. But if it takes you that long to do it, we will still do it. So that's why I'm saying, do it early. So President, as I said, Clause 36A, need a sense of what happens there. Speculative scheme, what is the definition for it? Mr. President, we should all read the matter from cabinet. This one, when I was told of it on Tuesday, when it was tabled in the house, I had to ask for a 
vote a copy of it. No, the same ministry paper 51 of 2019, cabinet issues the 10th of June. Because even the way my friends on the other side have been preaching the prosperity gospel, I did not expect to see the prime minister say poverty has been increasing. No, while before it was decreasing. So, so, I am weary of the promises that this bill is going to do great things. But I am prepared, Minister, to watch it from a critical support element. Because this, like other things you have done, may appear of good intentions. But the road to hell is off the pave with that stuff. I am disappointed, however, I must say. As I take my seat, Mr. President, as disappointed, as disappointed that I didn't get a single pint of water, because I set up my speech, I set up my speech to quote, to quote Cory Booker, to tell a certain senator, to tell a certain senator that you're dipping into the Kool-Aid and you don't even know the flavor. <laughs> but I didn't. Get, I, I didn't get a chance to do it because I was armed with this ministry paper which said otherwise. So Mr. President, may it please you, the opposition supports the regulation. We urge caution and we urge fundamental pension reform to come sooner. Portability, for example, is an issue that has to be addressed. But as we say, we thank you for facilitating the debate and allowing ideas to flow today rather than rush it. And I make a simple plea to those on your side. Compromise. Yes, Stretching across the aisles is a good thing. It's a sign of strength, not weakness. No, make, a plea. May, make a plea for prudent to lead more of the city. Yes. May, may the spirit May the spirit you brought, may the spirit that you brought to this debate, to this debate and the conduct of the Senate, may it permeate, may it dominate, and may it be the spirit of the government side going forward. May it please you, Mr. President.